mathematician is in her garden. It's a beautiful spot in the country in the middle of a kind of an open area surrounded by pecan trees. She hears the roar of a propane burner, looks up and sees this hot air balloon drifting over her place. And this man yells down, do you know where I am? She says, well, you're at about uh, 30 degrees latitude, and you're about 97 degrees longitude, 100 meters off the ground, drifting about two meters a second southwest. And he said, oh, you must be a scientist or a mathematician or something. She said, well, it turns out I am. How'd you know? She said, he said, because you gave me a very precise information, which I can do nothing with, I don't understand, and it doesn't help me. <laughs> and she said, you must be a businessman from a big company, probably marketing and advertising. And he said, why, yes, that's true. How'd you know? Because you're the one in the hot air balloon drifting that way, and you don't know where you are. And he said, it turns out I'm out of fuel and I have to land. And she said, just over the hill, there's a river and a nice pasture you can land. So that story is a bit of a microcosm of the world that I've spent the last 36 years in. A combination of business people and scientists and engineers, and sometimes we don't know how to communicate with each other. So let me start with a, how a historian would describe P&G. We were founded in 1837, are celebrating our 175th year, right? This is before electricity. This is even before railroads were broadly. Um, we were founded on the banks of the Ohio. We're the fifth oldest company on the Fortune 500. The other ones are banks. In fact, I think we might be the fourth. Um, <laughs> Cincinnati was the chief hog packing center, which is why we were there. Herds of pigs traveled our streets. We didn't have helicopters and we didn't have to shoot them, but um, it was the center of pig fat, and those were the raw materials of candles and soap. And our founders found married sisters, and their uh, father-in-law said go into business together, which they did. Turns out in 1837, John Deere also made a plow and founded his company out of an old saw blade and a special curve. Science and engineering are, I have good friends at John Deere in my world, my field, and uh, today an American farmer feeds 155 people worldwide. And in 1960, that was only 25.8. That's innovation, right? They're doing GPS remote control of vehicles to provide that degree of automation. Turns out there was another missed opportunity in P&G's history. Thomas Edison was a telegraph runner between our general offices and the P&G candle factory. You often wonder what relationship his role as a candle factory order runner had in his invention of electric bulbs and the other products, which today have led to you know, clearly something high tech um, jet engines. Turns out P&G didn't realize that we didn't sell candles, you see. We sold light. Thomas Edison understood that years later. But it turns out, in spite of that, we continued our progress. Uh, and in 18, 1937, this was our product family, mostly detergents. Um, by 57, we'd added other things related to fat. Um, not pig fat, but Crisco was a vegetable oil that mimicked lard and was widely used in um, cooking at that time. But also we were into oral care products, Crest as a brand existed then, uh, and hair care products like Prowl and um, Lilt. Today P&G is known by investors as a large global and the largest successful consumer goods company. About an $84 billion last year, $11 billion in profit. We serve about $4 billion consumers a year. They buy it at least once a month. 
Um, we consistently build shareholder value. This is why we exist as an entity. We just announced our dividend, and it's, we've paid dividends consistently uh, since, without interruption since 1890 and have, for 57 years, increased them every year. A market cap of about $220 billion. And the key is we innovate to grow. $2 billion a year in R&D. Now, it turns out most of you consumers would know us by our brands, right? So these are our brand and, and our approximate market size today. Hopefully, some of you recognize some of these brands. And uh, if you don't, the person next to you might have wished you had. <laughs> it's an old joke. Um, but it turns out brands represent our promise, which is what our base is, touch lives and improve life. It turns out if you think about your day as you begin your day and you walk through that day, our products touch that life in a small but important way. And those products, although they began a long time ago, have a heritage of innovation. So I got to answer the question in front of a group of scientists and engineers, why brands? All right? Why don't you spend that advertising money on the product? So I have to tell you there are two moments of truth in our business. That first moment of truth is when a purchase is made in the store or online or wherever. And then the second one is when you get it home and use it. Now I want you to imagine going to a grocery store and there's 300,000 products there all in white cardboard containers with words on them like soap you know, with a specification sheet. You know, shopping would take hours and you would still probably bring home the wrong thing. <laughs> so it turns out brands are a way to make a promise to you that is quickly recognized. You see, it turns out candles don't represent, you know, candles, they represent light and we don't sell them anymore because people really don't use candles for light. Tide represents clean not soap. In fact, the recipe and formula for Tide haven't stayed the same for, I don't know, three years straight for 50 years. It represents clean. And so that's what the brand is. The brand is that. Now, with that, I end my remarks called, um, that, I'll, that I'll call uh, business school and modeling, and, you know, and we're going to move on to now the science and engineering of the conversation. So let me answer the question, why rocket science? Why the rocket science for everyday things? All right, what's behind them? Everybody gets the fact that you need uh, science and engineering for jet engines and for even farm machinery or military or defense, electronics, oil and gas. These people kind of get that. But really, seriously, for toilet paper, for divers? You know, uh, where's the science? So let's talk about that. It turns out, in my world, just as in the world of, I have two challenges around making everyday things that improve life. One is contradictions, and the other is scale. So what do I mean by contradictions? So it turns out, there are, our products have to perform at that second moment of truth when we get them home. Advertising, you see, creates trial. People will try something, but not loyal customers. You don't last hundreds of years unless somebody actually thinks. I mean, Charmin is not a commodity product. Go buy commodity toilet paper anytime you want, I promise. Right? Go buy it. I doubt you'll continue to use it, actually. It is a branded product that you pay a premium for because it's soft or strong, and maybe you don't, but I will tell you, a lot of people do. Um, and it's because our, the performance of these products is driven by fundamental science and engineering contradictions. Contradictions in materials, toilet paper, strong but soft. 
Stretch, but not break. Breathe, but contain. Absorbent, but also strong, especially when wet. So here's an interesting problem with toilet paper. It can't actually be strong in the same way paper towels do. Why would that be? It would mess up sewer systems. In fact, we did modeling and simulation of the London sewer system because there was a period of time when we did make our toilet paper too strong for London's pipes. That was an interesting model. Anyway, <laughs> the other one is packages. Creative design is key, right? People want that immediate recognition, but things need to be strong and light. They must never leak, but open easily. We're not doing so well on that particular problem right now. Um, so let's talk about the title of my talk, uh, Formulating for Clean. So you see, it turns out we wanna, we're not in the business of clean. We're in the business of recovering garments. You don't have disposable clothes, right? If you did, we wouldn't have to wash them, but we want to recover them. So you want to clean and remove a soil and stain, but you need to protect skin and you need to protect the fabric. Turns out some of the more famous issues with laundry detergent in the last 50 years, was it clean, great, it just ate clothes. <laughs> so this is one of the challenges, how to formulate for clean and remove stain. And think about what a stain is. It's dye for, for your clothes. People often complain, um, why doesn't detergent get out ink, right? I mean, I have to tell you, my number one dominant garment recovery problem is the ink comes out of my shirt. And everybody goes, well, why doesn't Tide get ink out? And I go, well, what is ink? <laughs> right? You want your documents to go away? <laughs> right? We could write with a document and the ink goes away. It turns out it's a very hard problem because it's a contradiction where we want something that's permanent. And so, so if, if you could wash all the ink off of a paper with detergent, it really wouldn't be ink, would it? So that's, that's a contradiction. Here's another contradiction, a formulation. It has to be concentrated. You don't want to have massive quantities of stuff, but easy to use. That's actually interesting because as you concentrate things, they get thicker and gooier, and as you... Um, you know, but you have to pour it if it's a liquid and easier. We're going to talk about that later. Here's a, a mixture can't separate, right? So by definition, you have a mixture. I'm not talking about a solution. I'm talking about a mixture, but it can't separate. So oil, olay, freight, you know, radiant ribbons is a product where you actually have two different products, but this has to be on a shelf for years and not come, like, turn into one thing. Here's one, dispense easily, but stay put where applied. For all of you who might teach fluid dynamics classes, that's non-Newtonian fluids, <laughs> right? Because if toothpaste was Newtonian, it would have one of two properties. It couldn't come out of the tube without a lot of pressure, or if it did, it would pour all over the floor before you got it to the mouth. So it has to deliberately shear, be formulated to shear thin, which means when it moves, it's fast, it's low, low viscosity, and when it stops moving, it's high viscosity. That's not by accident. So back to the advertising thing. How many of you, by show of hands, remember this product? Wow, you actually admit you're that old. <laughs> We're going to watch a piece of advertising. A sign. Wow, I can have the cleanest wash in town. Salvo. A dime's worth of Salvo three power tablets explodes into detergents. Plus softeners, stain removers, and whiteners. Your detergent is okay, but for big, dirty washes, a dime's worth of Salvo is best. Until I dropped a dime in my washer, I never knew how clean my clothes could be. It's wash day for Mrs. Gordon Wade of Cincinnati, Ohio. Her problem, greasy wash. 
dirty wash, muddy wash. When you've got wash this dirty, there's only one way to get it clean. The bomb, the dirt bomb. Introducing Salvo's Dirt Bomb. Here's a cup of the most powerful detergent. This much more cleaning power is concentrated in a dime's worth of new Salvo, the ultimate weapon in the war against dirt. I tried being nice to dirt with creamy liquids and fluffy powders, but now I use the Dirt Bomb and blast dirt to smithereens. Does that sound cruel? Well, what's dirt ever done for you? Oh, thank God, those are 40 years old. <laughs> For anybody that wants to know where the word term soap opera came from, right, that's where it came from. We were the ones that actually produced the, you know, advertising like that. I brought that up because that particular advertising, first of all, is bad in my opinion, but, I, you know, our advertising guys say that if you like advertising, Tom, then we better change it. So... Um, <laughs> But the reality is, why do you think they emphasized in both those advertisements the exploding uh, tablet? See, it turns out <laughs> the reason why this product isn't sold anymore is because you had to put three tablets in because two of them would end up in the pockets of your jeans. <laughs> so, which means you wouldn't discover them until after you were folding the clothes, <laughs> right? It was just bad. It did not dissolve. This particular contradiction of something that is easy to use but dissolves completely is a very big challenge and is still a challenge today but one that oh, we have a product that I think has, has solved that largely. But um, it also shows you that in spite of advertising and so on, if the product doesn't work, People get it, stop using it. Okay, so those are contradictions. The second problem that we have is scale. We're in the consumer goods company. There's a lot of ways, we had 84 billion, a lot of ways to sell a billion dollars worth of goods. One way is to make a submarine, sell it to the government. Uh, another one is to make seven jet fighters, or you can make 20 airliners, 100 jet engines, that kind of thing. Or you can get into the trucks, tractors, car business and make hundreds and thousands of things. You can have, make electronics, which people think are masked. We're in the business to make our billion dollars of making two billion diapers. So how long do you think it takes us to make a billion diapers? So it's not very long. We make a billion diapers in about a week. And I can show you this video because it's really old. It's about 15 years old. Every flicker is a diaper. Every little noise you hear is another diaper being made. And it's really annoying, so we're gonna stop that. Um, that particular, but essentially think about this. Why do you think we make them so fast on a line? How much fair trade labor could go into making a diaper? You can't afford to pay people to put these things together. I don't care where they are in the world, right? Milliseconds. Everybody, from the receptionist to the fork truck driver, from the plant engineer to the plant manager to every foreman in the plant, right? The combined total uh, fair trade labor in a diaper can be in the milliseconds. That's it. So they have to be made really, really, really fast. And that's just the general term for anything that takes, that you have to make a billion of in a matter of days or weeks. Now it turns out my profession, modeling and simulation, is behind the business of simulating everything from the atoms to the enterprise that's involved in that. From the formulation of our products to how they're used by the consumers, to the process and production systems of how they're made. And they cover the entire spectrum of science and engineering uh, and, and in fact relate to medicine. So this is uh, what I do for a living, coolest job in the world. So let's start with a few examples. Computational chemistry made the news in our most recent Nobel Prize 
winners. This is a very simple, what's called DPD simulation of how soap works. Essentially, you have surfactants which carry soil beads away. You, it's probably hard to see, but at the far right of the little video, you see little pieces of red getting carried away, carried away by the, by the uh, blue. And in fact, it's important that it's moving, which is why washing machines have to rotate. Here's another soft nano behavior. Dr. Michael Klein and Temple, we've been working on something called an insight award at self-organizing organic compounds into bilayers. Bilayers are essentially the component around cell walls. Sometimes they form bilayers. Sometimes these bilayers fall, you know, rotate in on themselves and make something called micelles. And it turns out those micelles are behind what have make products have their Newtonian and non-Newtonian rheologic properties, whether they form spherical, rod-like, worm-like, branched micelles, and what the nature of They are essentially self-organizing things that are too small to see with any microscopes. We know these things exist almost by computation, more so than by anything we can observe, because they're so small. And in fact, we've been working um, with in places in Michigan, in Cincinnati, and Oak Ridge to deal with how these micelles split apart, join, uh, and what they end up, uh, how be basically being able to predict the rheology of the products. We also, it turns out this is behind laundry and cleaning mixtures. So vesicles, which are bigger than a micelle by about a factor of 10 or 100, these are closer to cells in their size. And they are self-organizing molecules that also happen in laundry. Detergent and polymers are part of this. And LAS stands for surfactant. It's a, it's a uh, surfactant definition. And so these are things that actually govern. And calcium, what is calcium there? Water hardness, right? We all know that hard water uses more soap than soft water. It turns out we know why this is because of the role it plays in how these vesicles are formed and how the detergents function. So we also worry about skin. Modeling the stratum cordium is an, at the outermost layer of protective skin and is something that has implications for us in both personal care and pharmaceuticals. This is also something we're doing with an insight award. We have about 56 million core hours of com computation we're using to understand Basically, the stratum cordium model, you know, typically in biology, we often draw the cartoons that are on the left. I come from a world where we want to see them much more like they are likely to be in the real world. Although molecules and their representations, you can't take a photomicrograph of that and see the thing on the right. But I can see it and do experiments with it. I can insult that bilayer with ethanol and determine what happens to that layer, which gets pretty disrupted and a lot of movement between, whereas I can also uh, disrupt it with, insult it with pentane, which tends to form, both of these are either hydrophobic or hydrophilic. And I can know that ahead of time. Um, now, these are common compounds, but what if I'm trying to do that with an ingredient or a treatment? Uh, computation here has allowed us to see what is not seeable, the third pillar. Also, though, more typically in computer-aided engineering, we've also applied this. We see modeling and simulation across all these disciplines. Sometimes it's only typically applied to solid and structural mechanics, but we see it in solids and fluids, chemicals, controls, optimization. And in fact, I'm going to show you some examples in computational fluid flow. This is actually a, a section of a diaper line and how diapers are made. We suck material diaper and the absorbent gel. You know that stuff that, you know, when your baby gets into the swimming pool and they sort of come out weighing 20 pounds? Um, that's, the, that's a polyacrylate gel. Well, how that's deposited is a fluid flow mechanics problem. It turns out that the, the initial solve of this is a multi-phase turbulent flow with accumulation at the boundaries problem. And that was done with CFD Live, which is a nuclear weapons code from Los Alamos. 
And in fact, we introduced flip markers to their code, um, which are a marker to keep track of the material at the boundary. Mixing liquids. So you mix, one of the problems with things that are Newtonian is mixing them. So things look like ice cream freezers. This particular mixer, although it has really fancy blades that look like airplane wings, isn't very good, turns out, right? You can pour stuff in the top and it'll take a really, really long time for the material to work its way to the bottom. And I can do this problem computationally. I don't have to go out and get a hold of a 10-foot diameter, 20-foot high tank and mess around with it. Here's an experiment. Fortunately, we never had to run. Drop this goo in the tank, and we would have been emptying the tank and scraping it out. And, and in fact, what we were able to show the people is don't use this. This is not how you mix these two things together. Um, the way you mix these things together is this way. And furthermore, I can tell you what the pressure drop is and how many mixing elements we need to do that. Um, this is something that essentially we're trying to replace experiments with computation. This particular article in Scientific American I'm somewhat proud of here, May this year, talking about assembled in code. This is the latest incarnation of the Salvo problem. Only we have a dose that's, and for those that might have known, Tide Pods is one of our most recent innovations is how do you put three liquids in a pouch that dissolves? Turns out the dissolving part isn't the hard part. You know, the, the, the film we figured out, the hard part is making it. And of course, I'm showing this to you because it's pilot scale. And so by my world, this is really, really slow. I need to make this in much bigger form. And it turns out I need to make it much faster. And this is still very slow compared to what we do today. And it has to move. And here's the problem. When one drop of that stuff is outside where it's supposed to be, that pod is a leaker. That leaker is in a tub where they're all leakers. And the whole container is ruined. So I need part per billion level quality control to do this right. And it turns out we did this with modeling and simulation. It seems kind of boring, but we used free surface flow, non-Newtonian computational fluid dynamics to make sure that how fast could we go, what are the momentum, where should the drops be, where should the liquid be. Without computing and modeling and simulation, Tide Pods would not have happened. Also, packaging, behind every great package, is a lot more than meets the eye. And this is where solid mechanics, if you're into these sorts of things, finite element, uh, are. and in our world, we tend to deal with non-metals. And it's how the bottle is made and how strong it is after it's made. Because if you make it too weak, you have a bag with a spout. And if you make it too strong, you have plastic that has to be recycled or in a landfill. And it needs to be a geometry that might be something interesting, not just the traditional uh, water bottle is, is something that's made to minimize material, but it normally doesn't deal with geometry. So we have to be able to test these bottles without making them. We have to test them, you have to test them as if they go through the Eisenhower tunnel. We have to test them when they get stronger or weaker. Uh, and we, so that's one thing we have to do. Another thing is we have to be able to convey them. This is our equivalent of a racetrack, about 2,000. This seems like an innocuous test, but it, it's a disaster. This is the anatomy of a disaster. This particular bottle had already been fallen in love with by our senior management, by consumers. We were supposed to make this. If this happens on a production line, you have a disaster. So this can't happen, and it's really simple. It just has to do with where centers of gravity. It's, it's typical kinematics. It's not even that complicated. The problem is I've got to do it before I go make bottles. And so today we do this problem with this way. And what's nice about this is, although this is also an example of a geometry that fails, uh, I can just have the video and say, give it to a designer and say, guys, this isn't going to work. We need, this. And then we can tell them what we want. But until I show them this, they're pretty happy with the bottle. 
But today, I don't have to make the mold to do that. Let's look at another piece of advertising. To many men, shaving is a sensitive issue. Try Gillette Fusion Pro Glide. Our micro-thin blades are thinner than a sheet of paper or even a surgeon's scalpel to put less stress on your skin by gliding through hair. Fusion Pro Glide, dermatologically tested for sensitive skin. So I actually don't hate that advertising. It was okay, but that's not why I'm showing it to you. Uh, it turns out that particular part of the advertising right there is not cartoon. That is actually a true, uh, accurate, finite element simulation of hair cutting. And in fact, hair itself as a material is quite unusual. People, this is not like fracturing a glass rod. This is much different than that. And we, this is one of the first examples where um, technology from my community has actually made it into advertising that we've used in the market successfully. Automobile companies do this all the time, but our products, you know, here's the problem. You know, if we had some guy in a white coat standing in front of a, a, a Charmin machine, you know, this big massive machine, we'd probably scare people, right? So, so we have, you know, we had Mr. Whipple for years, and now, <laughs> now we have some cartoon bears. But um, so sometimes you can't be too explicit about advertising. This is one where we could. Um, here's another thing that I'm pretty proud of. This particular model um, is a model of a bronze shaver being dropped on a bathroom floor. And the reason why I can show it to you with such detail is we never made this. Now, part of it to make this thing has 50, well, hundreds of parts in it. Every part has a separate mold. And just to make the prototype for this would have taken a long time and a lot of money. And it turns out this particular design, I don't know what that happened. Do you, could you help me with that? I must have pushed some button that brought it back. Thank you. So if you look at it, um, that particular part of the model didn't work. That part broke. And it, and it turns out that small parts have to work and everything has to work. And if I'd have made that, yeah, we'd have made it, physically tested it, but it would have cost a lot of money. It turns out I knew this design wouldn't work before we ever made it, and so we never made the part. And we changed the design, and I'm not gonna show you that design. Buy a bronze shaver and take it apart. <laughs> so here's another problem. Flag and string problem is a, as a fluid mechanics problem, fluid structures problem is another challenge. That particular part of a diaper, the so-called ear, trying to pull the flag and string through a, you have aerodynamics and structural mechanics, or for those that are in the room that know, you have an Eulerian frame of reference and a Lagrangian frame of reference, and you have to solve them simultaneously. It's actually much more difficult computationally than this little cartoon shows. But it's not a cartoon, this is a real simulation. Here's a problem. This is what you don't want to have happen to a bottle of Tide in Walmart. I can tell you, Walmart doesn't want to have it happen either, but you especially don't. And for those that are into fracture mechanics, you see some white around where the, which means this is a ductile fracture of plastic. Um, so it seems like a pretty normal thing, right? Not a particularly difficult problem, but it turns out that a finite element solution to this, you see where the red grows, what causes this is the label panel. It doesn't look like it, but it actually is kind of, the failure starts from below and works its way up to the, labor, the label panel and then rips. And so this is an example of where I'm work, we work out what the solution was before we built the prototype, but I wish I could say that, but that isn't what happened. What happened was we had a failure and I'm building a model after the fact, and I'll talk about that in a second. One of the things that I do in modeling and simulation is pathology, and I really hate doing pathology because the money's already spent. Here's an example of what the power computer is gonna do for granular solids. This is just a little experiment of granules that are actually part of the pure water filter. We've divested this brand, but when we owned it, we studied the actual filter granular material. And what we cared about was where 
did the water go? We took a micro CT of every single granule in the mix and created a finite element model of every single granule in the mix. We then put those granules together in a column and poured fluid through them and studied the interstitial flow area of where the water went. This, this, so I can actually tell you each uh, impurity, whether it touches the granule or not, by suspension. I can do that explicitly. You need really big computers to do this, and what would seem like a lot of patience, but what that really means is good software. This problem experimentally is almost intractable, other than bulk properties, but I can solve this problem directly. And here's back to the never, you know, uh, open easily, never leak but open easily problem. We're studying the kinematics of how to open jars. And it seems like a straightforward problem, but it turns out, again, to be a biomechanics problem that involves the full muscular skeletal uh, activity of the, uh, you know, of the human hand, which is one of the more complex uh, structures around. So let me close up with some management stuff, and then we can get some questions. The first thing I want to point out is that improving life and making dollars with M&S, that's our phrase for modeling and simulation, has an interesting path. So first is you define, you have to define the problem, which normally is translate your business challenge into science, and then express those science in equations. We then have to get data, and that data can be anything. It can be consumer ratings, plant reliability, material properties, geometry, ingredients. It can be a lot of different things, but you go get data. You solve equations, and I mean equations that normally today involve high-performance computing. You know, tens of thousands of cores. Now, one of the things you also have to do, back to the balloon problem, I have to communicate the results of my studies into the language of a business leader. I can't show half symmetry. I can't, you know, a few simple rules, right? Red is bad. Green is good. Red is hot. Blue is cold. Show full geometry, right? Movies progressing are normally in time. Those sound like real straightforward things, right? But scientists and engineers, we are very creative about our schemes. And, you know, if you think about weather, think about how weather forecasters talked to us 40 years ago. Like, we had to learn in school what the little diamonds and the half moons and the fronts and all that are, right? We had to learn how to read isobars on a meteorological map on the 10 o'clock news. You don't see that stuff anymore, right? In other words, that is, yet the simulations and model behind weather are more complex than they've ever been. But what you do to communicate to decision makers are, look, do you need an umbrella? Do you have to tie down your umbrella in your backyard? What's the story, right? You give people probabilities. You give them colors and maps that make sense. But the ultimate thing is we have to shape a decision. That means we have to reframe a question, guide a choice, stop a project, start something, do something different because you did a model and simulation. See, it turns out pathology, which is explaining why something that already exists or something that already works or doesn't work, is late. It's a little too late. Builds your credibility. If I predict what someone observes, it's amazing how quickly they go, wow, your models are right. What I really want to do <laughs> is do virtual trial and error. Next time, come to me with your idea, with your design, before it's real. Why don't we try it out before it exists in the real world? And even further, if you will indulge me, let me help my analysis lead your discovery. And I'm going to define option space, narrow the choices, tell you where things work and don't work before you go even try. Now that can be you have to be done that has to be done carefully because the models better be right if you're going to chase people away from space to look. But the reality is this is where money is made. So let me close with a theme for the future. 
Well, first of all, HPC, which stands for High Performance Computing, uh, is, is what's behind that. In fact, this is a very old graph that I got from Norm Johnson at, at uh, Los Alamos that talks about the history of computing up to the point where I was educated, right, the Cray One, which was the first 40 years of history. And it turns out, if we look at that over the next, um, the next 40 years, we've got to learn four new words. Giga, Terra, Peta, and Exa. Because our computers are now pushing that Exa boundary. So, you know, what's after that, right? Our children will know the words after Exa. Deca, and my favorite, it's probably not pronounced it, but I always pronounce it Yoda, because I just think it's funny. Um, but that, those are, those were, and, and look at that, look at that line, look at that trend. These are the high, these are the world-class machines. And in fact, at P&G, the first computer I worked on, which was way back then, and these are the supercomputers I work with today. Our supercomputing that we own, that we use every day to make the products that improve life, is about a decade behind a national laboratory machine. I say that without, uh, I say that without apology. We keep pace, and we've kept pace for 60 years, and expect to keep pace for the next 60 years, hopefully that we continue to invest in the high performance computing through the exascale. So our challenges are cashing in on Moore's law. One of the realities of cashing in for us is we have to replace our slow and expensive learning, right? We're in the business of science and, and improving life, not computers. We have to, and that's gonna require a relentless pursuit of realism. Our models need to become higher and higher fidelity because they're trying to replace more and more complex life. But here's the thing about Moore's Law, it's gonna be parallel and it's gonna have bigger data, which means we have a software challenge. And at some level, I'm concerned that people are not working on software. It's much more exciting to work on hardware, but not the software that solves our problems. And for those scientists in the room, we must have software that both spatially and temporally scales, right? Finite element and some of these other codes, like molecular dynamics, scale well spatially, meaning I can get ever more atoms, ever finer grids, ever whatever. But I need to compress time. I need tomorrow's weather to be part of an ice age prediction. And that's a time compression problem which I don't see people working on. And the final one is analysis democratizes. Now what that means is science and computational skills are gonna be part of every scientist and engineer's base. It isn't gonna be just the realm of the computer science or just the realm of the computational guys. It is the third pillar in the sense that it will be part of all of our education. Imagine an engineering and science, the, now I can say this because my father is a mathematician. And I would also say my father pioneered the use of Mathematica in his school. He was the chair of the math department at Missouri. He pioneered using it for the engineers. And I remember having an argument with him. I said, Dad, why are, he was teaching his whole class in Mathematica. I go, why are you doing this? Is in the, this is in the 80s. So why are you doing that? I said, you know, they have to do triple integrals by hand. I did. So he hands me this test. He goes, well, here's, your, here's the first problem on this exam, smart boy. Ball of radius one. We're going to drill a core off center of 15 degrees. What's the surface area of the core? And graph your result. Right? And I'm laying it out for about 10 minutes. And, you know, I got it wrong, of course. But... Um, and he said, five lines of Mathematica code. And he said, you know, there are some things you just don't have to know how to do by hand. And he met me. And, and so the point is, why are our graduate structural mechanics engineers, after the first day of a, of a hand calc doing kinematics, why are we not using finite element codes? Why are we not using kinematic codes? Computer codes need to be an increasing part of a scientist and engineer's education. 
So with that little speech, um, the other thing that's going to happen with democratizing is data management is going to end up being a bigger problem. Uh, and that's going to clearly be part of it. This isn't a big data speech, so I'm going to stay away from the rest of that. But with that, I'm going to end my remarks and uh, offer, I believe, to uh, answer some questions. Well, it doesn't have to be always questions. Nicholas Peppers from the University of Texas at Austin. Okay. I've worked with your company, and I must disclose that on the polyacrylic acid superabsorbents. It's a mesmerizing talk. When you started talking, I said, this is going to be soft science. <laughs> and, uh, and you have a very nice style to present the past. I didn't know the story about Thomas Edison. But I think I, I knew already what Procter & Gamble does and what the consumer products companies are doing in terms of... Uh, computation, and, and this is really fascinating. The very difficult problems in fluid mechanics, the very difficult problems in packaging. I remember 35 years ago, we would go to Continental Can and uh, American Can, and they would solve, quote unquote, the problems for us, and now it's not done that way. It's done in your line, you know, because you are considering so many problems of production at the same time. Not only how the product will, will uh, behave when it's in the hands of the computer, of, of the consumer, but much earlier. Uh, is this something that you think should come in education at the level of, I mean, you made your comments about undergraduate education, but to the point of students addressing consumer products, truly, truly real products, where you have very complex geometries. Don't forget the geometries that you showed, for example, in one of your, uh, what was it, one of the detergents. Those are never discussed, I think, not even in ISIS. <laughs> I don't think they, right. they do that. Well, I, I would say, you know, and maybe that's shame on us for not being a, a bigger part of, of kids' education. I know intellectual property, owning geometries and shape ends up being a very, um, it ends up sometimes serving as a barrier between industry and uh, both training of students, because what if they invent something, who's going to own it, this kind of problem. You see, I sometimes call it the Gatorade effect. Um, where states are more, we, you know, we get into a worry that a state is going to want royalties from a, an invention from one of the students in their school. And so we, you know, maybe not expose to them a consumer problem. But if you take packaging, just in general, you go into a grocery store, I would challenge you that at least 10% of the raw materials that are in packages in that store shouldn't be there. They are wasted materials whether it's the metal in the cans or whether it's the plastic in the bottles and it's certainly in the cardboard that protects the packages. You know, we, because, you know, people treat that stuff as so low tech that they go, oh, geez, I'm, you know, hi, mom, I just got my mechanical engineering degree and I'm turning down a job to go work on satellites to go work for a cardboard company in Georgia. We're going we're gonna to make cardboard better. It'll be better, I promise you. Now, it turns out cardboard is a lamin. It is a, the ultimate composite. It is a fluted structure. It is a disordered web. It has adhesives that are starch-based. Fascinating material. A hell of a lot harder to, to model and simulate than, than, the, than, the, than the composites that are in some of our other goods whether we call them golf clubs or whatever. But one of the challenges we have to overcome with our students, the low tech nature of everyday things, part of the reason why I give this talk is everyday things are as fascinating as an, and as exciting as you know what we might think is high tech things. Yes? That was a really, really wonderful talk. I enjoyed it immensely. Of course, one of the natural things that one is always concerned with when you look at a computational simulation. You can do, you know, simulation, use huge numbers of processors, do a gorgeous visualization, uh, but how does one know that the simulation closely corresponds to reality? <laughs> and one of the, I mean, this is obviously a very practical question for you guys. How do you validate an ambitious set of simulations, simulation technique, piece of software? 
So no, I, it's an excellent question. Uh, I have to answer it with two. I'll answer it quickly with a story, and then, uh, and then, and then really answer it. So I'm at a conference with automobiles, with with an automobile guy from BMW in Europe, and uh, one of that question was that he showed crash test simulations of uh, of folks, and uh, you know how do you know your crash test simulates the experiment? And here was his answer. He went, ooh they're still having a lot of trouble with the experiment. <laughs> so, and then he didn't laugh, right? And, and, then the, then my, and then he just stood there, and then my audience went, oh, now wait a minute, what is he talking about? And he said, let me explain. He said, a handmade, hand-welded vehicle that's made two years before we've tooled the production line uh, doesn't is really very difficult to make and wreck and have it perform properly. It turns out we can't really use it for design. So the only place we can do simulation is on the finished product that's machine made. The problem with the machine made product is all the tooling's already defined, the costs are already sunk, and it better already pass the test. And he said, and the biggest problem we've got is the guys running the final crash test don't run it correctly and get the wrong answer. So. What's occurring in this third pillar world for me is increasingly um, we are starting, when I get a mismatch and we get, we, we validate the heck out of the simulations because everyone believes the experiment except the experimentalists and everyone, you know, distrusts the simulation guys, right? I mean, it's kind of like a weird thing. We do a lot of elaborate validation experiments. And in fact, um, one of the challenges, we have to stop doing that. <laughs> we have to start accepting that if the, if the calculation has enough fidelity and has enough foundation, um, that the answer is probably correct. And if we have an experimental result, there's some, something else uh, that's missing. Now, this is, you're hearing this from a computational guy, right? My dad would probably kill me. But um, we have to, right now, one of the frustrations I have is probably 30% of the spending that I do externally is to validate experiments with, with test data, like skin penetration or whatever. I've got to do that with experiments. I'm, I'm looking forward to the day when I don't have to, when I finally have, the models are high enough fidelity and the computing is strong enough, I don't have to do that anymore. This on? Okay. Um, so this is a gender-based question. I was loved your example about opening things and the human hand. So clearly there are differences in strength from men and women, from children, adults, etc. And uh, I've always found it challenging to open those plastic tops. <laughs> in fact, I have to resort to one of those those little things that you that's an external aid. So how do you decide on the appropriate strength needed to break the plastic so to, the top can open, but also to keep the thing from spilling? Yeah, I you know it's it's embarrassing. I'm sad to answer this, right? In the progression of never leak and open easily, never leak wins. <laughs> okay? In fact, one of the problems, to, to finish this story, I get this phone call from, I'm, like Friday night, I'm going out of town, and I get this call, oh my, we got this disaster, I have a whole warehouse full of, of Febreze in a Tide bottle, and it, it's, uh, it, it, we can't open it, right? The cap torque is at, you know, 400, you know, 400 foot pounds, and it's some sort of crazy, you know, you have to have a device to open it, right? And they said, so we're going to put it in a warehouse overnight at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and, uh, you know, see if it softens the plastic, and maybe it'll be easier. And it, and it was like, can you model that for me, right? I was like, uh, not a chance. However, six months ago, if you would have brought me the bottle with Febreze liquid, I would have told you at what cap torque it would have leaked at. And so there is a, we do have standards for cap torque. Part of the challenge is we actually study, there are four different grips. There's the circle grip, the palm grip, the finger grip, the reverse. The re One technique is to do the reverse grip. It's a stronger grip, right? 
but use your machine. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but we have to fix that, and we are studying anthropomorphic differences. That's why I brought it up. But I've got to do that with simulation because I can't go recruit 10,000 people to open bottles all day, right? So we're gonna st we are studying that problem. With that, I'm gonna say. Goodbye. <laughs>